All right, I just have a few things that I wanted to touch base on, um, kind of an update on Scylla and a couple of observations that I was making out in the field. So we'll start with Scylla. And so I mentioned last time Scylla overwinters as an adult and that adult is a very particular form. It's a darker adult, whereas the one that you see on the screen right here uh, that I got a picture of today, this is what we call the summer form. And you can see it's got lighter stripes and markings on it. Uh, that helps you differentiate between which generations are really gonna be the ones causing the trouble. So right now we've moved away from our first emergence. Those adults that overwintered laid their eggs and those nymphs have now morphed into this adult generation, which as you can see over here on the picture on the right, um, also taken today, have started to lay eggs. So we're in a situation right now where I'm not seeing nymphs, I'm seeing adults and I'm seeing eggs. So if you're going to manage right now and you're in the sort of upper valley area uh, of Greenfield, um, you would be looking to manage eggs with an ovicidal uh, insecticide that has ovicidal activity. Uh, you do not spray insecticide to manage the adults. Uh, they're a pretty much moving target. Uh, you'd have to be hoping that the droplets would hit them directly, which is not the best way to manage. If you were going to do anything to deter the adults from causing um, indirect harm by laying eggs, you would be thinking about putting an oil out. However, when putting an oil out, of course, temperatures become an issue. And looking at the forecast, um, Sunday and Monday are gonna be cooler. However, both of those days are um, bookended by days where the temperatures are getting up into the 80s. So that's pushing up against where the, um, the oil is gonna be potentially causing damage. So right now, Probably not the best time to prevent egg laying, but it is or by using oil for the adults, but it is a good time to be managing your eggs and keeping an eye out for nymphs if you've got pears and you've got a history of psyllid in your orchard. Um, so over here, you can see a couple of materials that are effective. Uh, Delegate, also XRL I didn't put up there. Centaur is really effective. Um, if I remember correctly, you only get two applications of Centaur per year, um, as, as uh, the label states. Um, and Portal is also good. And, you'll see that there are different um, IRAC codes associated with that, different rotation codes. Paracilla is very prone to developing resistance to insecticides. Their generations tend to overlap, so it's easy to um, develop resistance with that, and especially if you're using the same material repeatedly and have been over years of time, um, you might find yourself with a pretty significant Scylla issue. Um, so rotate, keep an eye out, and remember those hard shell nymphs, those darker ones, they are not easy to kill. So you really want to focus in on your um, egg stage and your early instar stage if you're not going to use oil to prevent egg laying. All right, so the other thing that I'm seeing, and I'm not sure, I can see this really clearly because I've been staring at this picture through the microscope and on my computer all week, but what we're seeing here is a um, very early instar leaf miner larvae. It's kind of right in the center of that picture and it's a lighter yellow as opposed to the green color of the leaf around it. So right now these um, larvae are early instar and they're doing what we're call, calling sap feeding. So the mines are really only visible on the other underside of the leaves and as they get older they'll start to feed on the tissue and that's when you see that characteristic mine, um, what we call the tissue feeding. And so Early instars are doing the sap feeding. They're gonna develop into the later instars, which will do tissue feeding. Now, that all having been said, most orchards don't tend to have leaf miner problems unless they've been using broad spectrum insecticides to manage other pests, in which case those parasites that would normally affect the, um, the larvae, that would uh, lay eggs in the larvae, much like Jaime was just showing with the, uh, the wasp. There's wasps that also lay their eggs in the leaf miners. And so if you're using broad spectrums, there's a the potential that you're gonna be knocking those parasites down, which could potentially cause an outbreak in leaf miners. Um, if you do have an outbreak of leaf miners, what this, these materials here on the screen, again, just a small selection, uh, the tree fruit guide online will give you the, the laundry list of materials that are effective, uh, but these are effective for leaf miner. So, I try to end on a silver lining because I always feel a little bit like the harbinger of sorrow <laughs> telling everybody all of these pests that are out and about in their orchards. Um, last week I shared uh, a picture of a female 
spined soldier bug laying her eggs. Um, she's actually laying her eggs in the window that's directly in front of me right now. So this morning I looked out and I saw that the nymphs had hatched. And so that's what you're seeing here. Um, you can even see at the very bottom of that egg mass, there's one still sort of like trying to get out of the egg. Um, so again, these predators are about in your orchards and just knowing what they look like and remembering uh, to differentiate them from brown marmorated, uh, like Jaime was showing you, uh, is really important so that you can help maintain and foster these populations so that they can help you manage pests like the parasitic wasp that affects the um, leaf miners. So these predators are about in your orchard, selecting insecticides that have um, reduced off-target um, impact is really important, and keep your eyes peeled for these guys. Not only are they really cool to see, but um, they're really helpful for you. So with that, I'm going to ask Heather to share what she's been observing. Okay. Let's see. Uh, all right, that looks okay now? Looks great. Oh, okay. So, yes, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about plum curculio and European apple sawfly and coddling moth. But I was just realizing there's quite a few blueberry growers on here and I just that haven't probably been on the other ones. And so I just wanted to mention a little bit about winter moth. Uh, winter moth caterpillars are really, they're finished feeding for the year. So they are all done. Um, there might be a few still out there, but most of them have dropped into the ground where they pupate and then the, the moths will emerge in the fall. So, um, and we had a little bit uh, more winter moth caterpillar damage this year than we've had uh, last year. Um, so I know that there were some blueberries, my few blueberries in my yard had more damage this year than the last couple of years, so that was a little disappointing. Um, but so winter moths are always going to be with us and uh, it's just something we're going to have to deal with every year. That's why it's so important to go out and scout your blueberry patch, your apples each year uh, around tight cluster time, looking for caterpillars and determining whether or not you need a spray. So I'll be interested to hear from people that did spray from, for winter moth this year and the ones that didn't spray and, and let me know what your outcome was. Uh, I have heard from a few landscapers that there are you know, a little bit more uh, winter moth than we had had in the past. Okay, so Plum Cuculio, and you, you can see by this picture, this is not my picture, I think it's Dean Polk's picture, but uh, Plum Cuculio is also a pest on blueberries. Not a very big pest, not much of a problem, but it can attack uh, blueberries. So, uh, it, Rhode Island's a little bit ahead of most of Massachusetts, and we had, last week was a very big week for uh, plum curculio damage last week in orchards. So in, in an unsprayed orchard, actually it also in a sprayed orchard, saw quite a bit of plum curculio damage. And you can see on the left side, okay, here's the, it's you know, a little bit hard to see, but the fruit are fuzzy usually, and it's a little bit hard to see the scar, but that's a plum curculio egg laying scar. And this is a, a feeding scar of plum curculio. I'm gonna go back. So when we take a look at the plum curculio, it has this long snout. And so when it's feeding and it sticks its uh, proboscis into the fruit, it will kind of hollow out um, an area that's off-centered from the hole. So that's what plum curculio feeding looks like. And then here's also, this is a very new plum curculio. So the, uh, the female cuts this, this smile into, uh, into the fruit and then she uh, deposits an egg. Sometimes she doesn't deposit an egg. She will, she will make a lot more cuts into fruit than she will actually deposit eggs. But you can see this one, I, I, I pulled apart this plum curculio scar and you can see the egg there right underneath the flap. So plum curculio are active now. They like warm, humid conditions. They, they move into the orchard you know, uh, during uh, pre-bloom and then they get active once there's fruit out there and they love warm and humid conditions just like we're having now. So last week was a big week for plum curculio um, and this week is now turning out to be a, a, a big week also for plum curculio. Yeah this was a, an orchard that had been sprayed and uh, you can see the egg laying scar here and then just a few little nips taken out of this, this uh, fruit now. Um, 
I was looking at an unsprayed orchard, I think that was Monday, uh, and it was uh, uh, coastal Rhode Island, and I saw zero plum curculio, and I think it was just uh, that much further behind, you know, near the coast, you have the uh, cooling effect of the ocean, and so the, um, it seemed that over on Aquidneck Island or uh, in that area, close to the water, um, there was not plum curculio last week, but I bet there is this week. So, you know, we talk a lot about degree days. I don't know too many growers that really like degree days, but so, you know, we need uh, coverage until 308 degree days, base 50 after Macintosh petal fall. Usually turns out to be about the middle of June. Um, so in middle of June, that's when the plum curculio are finished migrating into orchards. So we really need to have insecticide coverage up until the time that they're done migrating in. So, you know, you need to spray within, say, seven days of that, uh, the end period there, the middle of June or thereabouts. Um, currently, at least in Rhode Island, we're at about 200 degree days. And this time of year, depending on the weather, depending on the temperature, of course, we're accumulating between 15 to 25 degree days per day. Uh, and NUA does a great job showing you how many degree days we have. So at least in Rhode Island and, and nearby Massachusetts, you know, your final plum curculio spray uh, can really be made over the next week. You know, it really matters uh, when we, we time things by that Macintosh petal fall. So you need to know the petal fall. And then if you're taking a look at degree days, um, you can determine when the end of the migration of plum curculio is. Uh, these are some insecticides that, that it work pretty well against uh, the plum curculio. Um, I'm very excited about Jaime's research. He's comparing the, this uh, new chemical, the vertiprin, against uh, Avant, I believe. Right, Jaime? Is that what you're doing? I, <laughs> anyway, I'm very curious about this vertiprin, if it's yes. going to work well. Is that right, Jaime? Yes, 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 correct. Yes, OK. So Jaime's got some experiments comparing the vertiprin and the Avant. Uh, you know, imidan is our old standby, but I know um, lots of people want to get away from using imidan. And uh, really, there, there haven't been a lot of really good options. So I'm, I'm hoping that vertiprin can, can do well, because Avant, I think it's, it's, it certainly is not as good as, as imidan. Uh, if you're finding that you have rosy apple aphids as well, I didn't have a picture of this, but you've got that really twisted up leaves, very tightly rolled up leaves. Um, uh, from rosy apple aphid. And if you do have rosy apple aphid, you can use the uh, Actara or Exeril or the uh, Minecto Pro. Minecto Pro, I don't know how to say that. Um, and that will control that rosy apple aphid as well as plum curculio. Uh, so, uh, European apple sawfly. This, this was like the first insect that I learned about with apples way back, <laughs> way back when. Uh, so anyway, a lovely, you know, fun little scar there of the European apple sawfly. The, it's the, the sawfly adult, the wasp comes out during bloom and lays its egg on the, on the flower. And then the, when the egg hatches, it burrows underneath the skin of the apple and will cause this windy trail. So I am very excited because I have never actually seen the larva under the skin. And so I picked at this one that hadn't, uh, the scar wasn't very far. And look at this, I have the larva underneath the skin. I've never seen that before. Pretty darn exciting. So, and these, the European apple sawfly is very easy to kill. Uh, and I think most of our insecticides will go right through the skin and kill the larva underneath there. So you might see the beginning of a, of a trail and then it ends. But if you don't kill them, um, this is what happens with the European apple sawfly. That cute little larva then becomes a big ugly larva and it then burrows right into the center of the fruit. So this is in June. These are, you know, smaller than golf ball size fruit. Um, but it will go into a second fruit and sometimes a third fruit. Uh, and then those fruit fall off, which is good. Uh, here's a little larva inside here, but it makes a rather big hole, kind of a big mess. Um, so, but that's what happens if you don't control European apple sawfly. We don't see this very often. Uh, but I'm thinking as we get more into cider apples and uh, uh, organic production, um, we can see more of this European apple sawfly. 
it, sometimes I think that maybe European apple soft fly could help thin the fruit. Um, if you could just train the soft flies to go after the fruit you wanted, you'd be all set. Because as I said, these fruit will drop off and they don't tend to get all the fruit in a cluster, but that seems like a risky way to thin fruit. So coddling moth, and I, this was from last August 1st, and I'm showing you this picture because each of these reddened apples is, uh, these, each apple was damaged with coddling moth, and really about 30%, maybe even higher than 30% of the apples in this whole orchard were um, infested with uh, coddling moth last year. So coddling moth, the, uh, this is uh, typical uh, August damage where you can see the frass. It's usually at the calyx end, at the flower end of the fruit. Uh, there's a caterpillar that's gone uh, into the hole. It usually enters the fruit from the calyx end and will kick out all this sawdust. Here, I just sort of moved it away to show you what it looks like. And then the, the, the larvae tend to go to the core to feed. So they'll make this horrible, uh, trail through the through the apple. You can see the larva here. Uh, don't, don't show you very much what it looks like, but if you see something like this, it's coddling moth. So you know that European apple soft fly I was showing you, that is in June. So uh, you don't see, you don't get confused with European apple soft fly and coddling moth, but uh, the coddling moth, it goes to the core. You'll, you can see the caterpillars in there. So coddling moth, they usually, uh, the adults emerge, they, they overwinter as larvae, and the adults emerge around petal fall of Macintosh. Now, this is where we also can, can hang up traps and get a biofix, but I don't, I don't like setting up insect traps. I think it's a, a lot of work, and I don't check them as often as I need to. So I just sort of go with the Macintosh petal fall, which I think works out pretty well. So the... Um, the moths emerge for about 40 days, so starting at petal fall, and then over the next 40 days they can emerge. That's a long time. Uh, the, the females deposit eggs on developing fruit, and then it takes about a week for the, for the eggs to hatch, and then they immediately enter the fruit, which um, makes them a little bit challenging to control, because if they're, they're, the way we're killing most of the coddling moth is by insecticide being on the fruit, and when the caterpillar encounters the, the skin of the fruit, that's when it needs to die. So, you know, it's a caterpillar, so you would think that maybe a BT insecticide would work well. Well, the BTs don't work very well because, uh, I think because the caterpillars just aren't even ingesting enough BT on their way into that apple. So, you know, so right now we've got adults emerging, uh, and then there'll be a second generation. So around mid-July to in, into August, we'll have the next generation or the summer generation of coddling moth emerging. And this is the damage that we see when I showed you the pictures of the damage. That's where we see most of the damage. Uh, and that's in August and September. So as I said, with, for insecticides, primarily we're trying to go after the larvae. And there's you know, quite a few insecticides at work. Um, you, know, see, you see the list there. I'm not gonna really go over these. You know, you guys can go and take a look at all of our presentations online and um, pause them and so you can get a list of pesticides or they're also in your New England uh, tree fruit management guide. So there, as I said, most of the insecticides are to target the larvae, but some insecticides also go after the eggs. So these need, these need to be applied earlier, a little bit earlier in the season than the, ones, than the insecticides that you're applying for uh, larvae. So things like Esteem and Ramon and, uh, and, uh, and Intrepid go after the eggs. So this is from RIMPRO. You've heard John talk about RIMPRO before. And so this is really a pretty easy uh, graph to look at, believe me. Um, so this is, so we're looking at adults down here. So this is for Greenville, Rhode Island. We have a RIMPRO uh, virtual weather site there. Um, I put in a biofix of, of May 17th, because that was our Macintosh petal fall. So that's the petal fall date. So rather than have a larval, excuse me, catching any moths in a trap, I'm using this date and I put that into RIMPRO and then it follows the weather patterns and the temperatures. And there's my, there's my cursor. And so these light blue lines, this is, uh, their, their best guesses at when, um, 
females are emerging and this light blue are the virgin females. So they have not been mated with yet, so they can't lay eggs yet. The dark blue is uh, the mated females. The yellow here are the eggs. So this is when eggs can start being laid. So as you can see, so and this, this line right here is today, June, June 4th. So you can see we're really just exactly getting into when most of these eggs are being laid. And then here is the egg hatch. So very soon these eggs are gonna be hatching, like within a couple of days. And I'm imagining uh, you know, when we see this uh, graph in another week or so, the, um, the number of larvae hatching is gonna go way up. So we're really just getting into plum, excuse me, into coddling moth uh, time right now. Um, but then, you know, you know, as I said, that the adults can emerge for 40 days. And if you have a high population of coddling moth, like that orchard I was showing you that had like 30% damage, um, you probably have a whole lot of overwintering larvae that are then going to, uh, you know, become adults and lay more eggs. And so, you probably need to control coddling moth for you know a couple of sprays a couple of sprays one spray for coddling moth is probably not going to do it and you probably want to put on a spray about now and then maybe another spray in about 10 days or two weeks um that's what i think and then i also i, I took the rim pro for coddling moth from the umass orchard and so i didn't see john that, that, that you put in any um petal fall date here, or maybe you're, anyway, uh, so I don't know exactly when your petal fall date was, but this is what RIMPRO is doing for your um, coddling moth, but you can see it's a little bit behind where we are in Rhode Island. Uh, eggs have been deposited or will be deposited very soon, entering some peak time, uh, but larvae haven't started hatching yet. Okay. <clears throat> 